Kia ora kato, nā mai hari mai. Uh, greetings and welcome to this month's EHF Live Investor Session. Uh, Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of entrepreneurs and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. These are informal sessions where we interview the investors and we ask them what their plans are um, to do in New Zealand so that when they leave the 60 minutes, you have a good sort of feeling and understanding of who they are as a person and what they will be doing. And so that you can just contact them directly when, um, when we've left the session. So Sean will leave you with his contact details after the session. And so this month, you're gonna hear from Sean McGrail. He is a, um, he is calling himself a recovering entrepreneur. Um, and he's also now an investor with Golden Seeds. So we'll get Sean to introduce himself shortly and tell us all about his paint night and a few other um, activities that he's been doing prior to being an investor uh, in the New Zealand um, ecosystem and also back up in Boston where he's based now. So just a quick reminder that this is being recorded. And so you can stay muted, but I think because we're a nice small group, we can unmute to ask questions. So feel free to ask any questions as we're going along, or you can put them in the chat if you want me to ask them on your behalf. But um, firstly, Sean, welcome and um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, well, uh, where should I start? I've, I've uh, lived and grown up in the Boston area uh, my whole life. Um, and at an early age, my mother was an entrepreneur. Um, a very She had a lot of small businesses. Uh, you might call her a serial entrepreneur. Um, she was never able to really scale anything. But uh, sort of, I was in the trenches with her uh, as free labor as a child, um, if you will. And uh, I was able to sort of witness sort of the struggles that small businesses go through to kind of start and grow the business. Um, so that when I get older and um, was in my late 30s, um, a friend of mine and myself, we started a business called Paint Night. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's painting and drinking at bars. Um, really simply, we get... Um, a local artist who will stand uh, in front of a crowd of 30 people who have never painted before and walk them step by step through a painting. Um, the artist brings all the materials, the paint, the brushes, um, uh, everything everybody needs. And everybody has a couple glasses of wine, has a fun time, music playing. It's, it's definitely not a class, it's more of a party. And um, just, it's basically a, a silly girls night out, uh, if you will, just kind of fun with your friends. Um, and not really, uh, some people think it's a, you know, college level art class. I, uh, you're, it's, it's a little bit tougher than uh, paint by numbers, but not much. Um, so we started that in Boston in 2012. I'm not really sure if it was just going to be sort of a one-off event, um, or really scale, we were able to sell out our first night and uh, really kind of check that box of product market fit. Um, it uh, started to quickly scale. We um, basically put up 16 events on our calendar and uh, within 11 hours it was sold out. So it was really quick uh, finding that match. Um, and from there we started to iterate on it and think about how we can expand it um, internationally. So we decided to become sort of a platform where any artist around the world would be able to run their business, um, their paint night business and license out our name. So uh, we work similar to the way Uber or Airbnb um, works that they're the artist, um, you know, instead of having a car or a house, their talent of being able to paint and entertain a crowd is um, what they bring to the table and we bring technology, customer service, marketing, um, you know, consolidating purchasing power to get canvases cheaper and paint and things like that. So um, we were able to scale that really quickly throughout the United States, uh, Canada, South Africa, um, you know, the UK, anywhere there was an artist who wanted to use uh, our name and our website, we were able to license it out. And it was a 70-30 split, whereas uh, the artist kept 70% of the money and we kept 30% of the money um, that came in to cover the cost of marketing and customer service and whatnot. Um, we scaled it very quickly. So within four years, um, we were doing 65 million in sales, um, US dollars. So um, we were number two in the fastest growing um, 
companies in the U.S. at the time. So we grew 36,000 uh, percent during that time frame. Um, and a lot of our artists, they were sort of first time entrepreneurs. Um, the way we positioned it was that we were their partner in business. But, you know, because they're getting 70 percent of the money that uh, about 70 percent of the responsibility fell on their shoulders. So it was um, sort of a lot of it was about coaching them on how to run a business efficiently um, and, and whatnot. Um, and, you know, through that experience, um, a, a lot of things kind of came into play of sort of why my focus now is on supporting female entrepreneurs. Um, most of the artists were um, single women, uh, often moms, um, 90% of our employees were women and 90% of our customers were women. Um, so there were certain aspects that I, I found, um, you know, it was sometimes easier for us to hire women as employees because some of the bigger corporations look down on uh, women who were coming back to work after five years off of raising their kids. So we were able to find really high caliber women um, you know, at, at a lower uh, salary than they were really worth um, or they were overlooked by. So it was an opportunity uh, for us, but I also thought it was like really unfair what was happening. Um, and then um, I, I exited the business in 2017, sold to a private equity company and I became an angel investor um, associated with Golden Seeds, which uh, funds female led businesses um, and you know, I think technically they look for companies that are, you know, doing about a million in revenue, but uh, I often get involved with um, founders who are sort of just in the idea stage um, up to about 500,000. So that's sort of my sweet spot of like helping uh, new founders put up those guardrails and, uh, you know, figure out how to scale the business quickly um, and, and sort of make a go at it. Nice. So. Um, nice. That's really good. Good to hear. It sounds exciting to a great company to have worked with, Paint Night. Um, so what's your connection to New Zealand? So what's drawn you to EHF and to New Zealand? Yeah, so uh, in 2004, I was sort of uh, in between careers and I found myself on, a, I took a trip around the world, um, which gave me the opportunity to come to New Zealand um, for two weeks um, during that trip. And um, of all the places I traveled to, it, there's sort of a sense that it just felt like home. Um, you know, I'm not sure if that's just because, you know, New England and New Zealand are um, sort of old English colonies, uh, maybe a lot of cultural similarities, um, both English speaking, um, have rolling hills of green, um, but it, it just felt like home to me. So that was sort of my first experience um, with New Zealand. And then in 2018, uh, my wife and my daughter, we took us another trip around the world and um, I made sure that New Zealand was an additional stop, but uh, this time was a few more um, wineries that were involved um, instead of any long hikes. And uh, so um, we both felt like this is a great place um, to raise a child. And, um, you know, we, we were like, let's uh, make a go at it. And we found out about EHF. Um, it just really aligned with, similar to what I'm doing here in Boston, I help a lot of startups here in Boston, um, sort of mentor and advise them um, and occasionally write a few checks uh, for the, the ones uh, that, are, you know, seem to be able to make a go at it. But, uh, you know, that's sort of what attracted me to, to New Zealand. Mm, that's good. And what would you like to do here in New Zealand? So what's your intention? Yeah, so uh, very similar to what I'm doing here in Boston, which is advising, mentoring and uh, investing in small early stage startups. Um, again, uh, tip, um, I generally are industry agnostic, but um, I like sort of the, the zero to, you know, I'd say 20 employees, um, a million and less in revenue, um, you know, everything from idea stage on um because i think where i can really help out is with you know pricing uh just general business plan financial models um things like that um and even just coaching founders on how to grow a team and let go um 
you know, and really sort of delegate. So uh, that's sort of my sweet spot. And I, I hope to do the same there of really uh, helping the ecosystem in general um, sort of grow and prosper. Cool. So just speaking of, um, on that, on the, the people side of it, so culture and people, um, how do you get a thousand people to work together? Uh, great question. I mean, uh, a lot of it, I, I think it comes down to, um, you know, everybody talks about their corporate values um, and, you know, we'll put them on, paint them on the walls and whatnot. Um, but they need, really need to be something that um, is sort of living and breathing within the organization. Um, I do know a lot of people will go on retreats and write down their five corporate values, but then when push comes to shove, they don't live up to them. Um, but we really use that, um, you know, at every single day. And, uh, you know, when you run into situations where you have a high performing employee, but who is not living up to the values, um, and sometimes you need to let that person go, um, you know, even if they're the number one rock star, um, because they're not living up uh, to the corporate values. And that really, um, you know, sometimes as the founder, you might not be able to see what's happening um, with everybody down below. Um, but when you do live up to those values, it really inspires uh, the rest of the organization. And, you know, you get a lot more credibility, um, you know, when you, when you stay true to those values. And, and it continues to um, attract other employees as well um, to the organization because people will bring in their friends and family and, um, you know, it's about creating culture um, that's true and honest. And uh, I, I think it's, you know, unfortunately, um, a lot of people put up these values and they're not sort of honest with themselves of what the company really stands for. Um, so that's where I, I see things often go wrong. Mm, thanks, Sean. So just getting back to Paint Night, whether this is your example you'd use or any of the other companies you've sort of been working with. So going from zero to 50 million, how do you scale your business quickly and what to watch out for as you grow? I mean, I think there's a great opportunity with technology um, to be able to infuse it. So, um, you know, whether it's a small restaurant or, you know, a paint night um, and, and some of other, you know, businesses um, really kind of taking a look at where you can add technology to speed and scale things and help you manage things from afar. Um, so, you know, for us at Paint Night, um, we knew that we wanted to open up, you know, globally because it's much more interesting to be in 300 cities than it is to be in one. Um, but we were thinking about how are we going to manage these artists um, globally. So the, what, what we did is a solution was we um, would send an email, an automated email to all the customers um, immediately at the end of the event, asking to rate the artist from a scale from one to five. Um, and we would let the artist know that if they scored on average below a seven, they would be kicked off the platform because they were ruining it for um, everybody else. And uh, the artist and ourselves would get the report at the exact same time. So it was just all automated. Um, and it really helped us manage, you know, 1100 artists around the globe without actually having to be there. So that's just one example of how we, you know, tried to think through of like, how can we add technology where it's all automated? Um, and, you know, it's boiled down to a simple number that's very understandable for everybody. Um, and the artist felt like it was fair, um, that it wasn't sort of some judgment coming from us that they were good or bad. Um, we would tell them, you know, you just have to make sure the customer is happy and satisfied um, with their night out. And, you know, you'll be able to prosper on the platform. So, um, and that also helped us recruit people too, because a lot of artists, when they would hear that, this was sort of all automated and they weren't going to be able to like maneuver or schmooze with us to try and stay on the platform. They sort of self-selected out um, from even joining up in the beginning because they were like, I don't know if I could deal with that scrutiny. So, um, you know, it, it worked for us. Um, and, and there were multiple uh, times where we would think like, okay, 
you know, we might only be at 100,000 in sales now, but if we want to get to 10 million, how, how do we get there um, and what needs to be automated? So thinking of that future state, um, we used to do a lot of current state, future state uh, chalkboards and then write out what we need in the middle uh, to get there. So keeping the entrepreneur head on then and for this growth, so in the sales and marketing side of the business, how can New Zealand companies grow to do 100x in the US? I mean, on one hand, uh, it's uh, for consumer products, it's, uh, you know, and services, it's, it's a little bit easier just because, uh, you know, New Zealand is, you know, 2% of the size of the US. So 100x, uh, it might not be that hard, but if you just uh, jump over to the, the pond to the US, um, but there's just a lot more opportunity uh, in the US and uh, to capitalize on, on the population uh, differences. Um, and then also there's a lot more channels that will work uh, internationally. So one of the growth areas that we had was Groupon um, here in the US. And at the time, the size of Groupon was rather large and sort of aligned with our target audience. Um, so finding those right marketing channels for uh, whatever your product or service services um, can really open up a lot of doors. And, and one of the challenges is to find that right marketing channel. Mm, yeah, true. And I might, some of these topics, what I've done is gone through a broad range of topics um, team so that if there are any that you want to go in deeper on, you can just ask those questions of Sean. But I just want to now switch it to you as the investor. So a question and sort of theme here is a good business versus an investable business. Why investors are not investing in your profitable business, right? It's often people think, oh my God, my business is so great, but why is no one giving me it? The funds I need. Yeah, so I mean, I, I run into that a lot. Um, you know, as an investor, people are kind of shocked that they're running a, a really great business um, and it's profitable, um, but they, they are, are always asking like, why isn't any investor? They talk to a lot of investors. Every investor says you've got a great business, but nobody pulls out their checkbook. Um, a lot of that just has to comes down to um, confidence that they have the ability to scale. Um, so some people, you know, have a great pizza shop, if you will, um, but unless you plan on opening up 100 pizza shops, uh, most investors aren't willing to write their checkbook if you don't uh, present them a, a really broad vision of where the company can go. Um, so, and, and it's not a knock on that you're running a bad business or um, that your business isn't good. It's just that, uh, you know, what I would typically call a lifestyle business, it's probably gonna be enough to support you and your family and, uh, you know, buy a house and put kids through college, but uh, it might not um, be what I consider an investable business just because it can't scale. And um, a lot of angel investors, you know, wanna see 10X their money and VC and private equity wanna see four, uh, three to four X uh, their money invested because, you know, they're playing with a portfolio where they have uh, to absorb a significant number of losses. Um, so you need a couple of home runs to kind of make up for that um, from a portfolio standpoint. So um, that's sort of the mindset that investors are coming to the table with. Um, and it's not really a knock on your business uh, per se. Okay. Thanks. Um, Ashita, you've got a question? Yes, thanks, Michelle. And, and Sean, I just came back from Boston to New Zealand. So good to see someone on the other side of the pond. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to actually ask you a little bit more about Golden Seeds and your work with um, female entrepreneurs, because um, I see there's so much opportunity. Um, there's a problem and there's so much opportunity in the market by focusing on gender smart businesses and startups. Mm -hmm. But I definitely see there's a little bit of a difference in how things are in U.S., how many investors there are to how the New Zealand market is getting more smart on this by communities like Shio um, getting more active. So would love to hear, Sean, how you found that with Golden Seeds and any uh, advice for New Zealand as well. Yeah, so um, for Golden Seeds, one of the problems they're trying to solve is um, 
you know, I think it's only 7% of uh, the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. And, uh, you know, I think it's even more abysmal of the number of uh, female founders who get funding. Um, but if you look at the studies, um, female founders and female-led businesses tend to outperform perform their male counterparts. Um, so as an investor and, in, you know, just being uh, greedy on a certain level, uh, it makes sense to invest in female-led uh, founders. Uh, Golden Seeds is one of the largest uh, angel investment groups. It's got about 300 uh, investors, uh, mostly centered in uh, New York, Boston, and Silicon Valley. Um, there's a few others that are scattered throughout the United States, but it tends to be um, a fairly active angel group. Um, some of the things that would make it challenging for a New Zealand uh, company to pitch to Golden Seeds is Golden Seeds only invests in U.S. incorporated um, businesses. So uh, you would need to set up some sort of footprint uh, in the U.S. in order to apply for funding from uh, Golden Seeds. Um, you'd have to make that decision pretty early on. Golden Seeds uh, typically you know, check sizes um, collectively within the group, I, I would say between 100,000 and 500,000 um, as a group. So if you're looking for, you know, a million or $2 million, you'd want to combine it with other either angel groups um, or other angels. Um, Golden Seeds is struggling to try and decide if it's a very early stage. Um, organization or if they want it to be de-risked de a little bit further. Um, so if you go on their website, they do ask that you have a million dollars in um, revenue, which is actually a pretty high bar. Um, so I think they're trying to figure that out. Uh, there's other angel groups out there like Pipeline Angels um, that invest in female-led businesses. Uh, Pipeline Angels is one of the largest um, that is specifically focused on funding female-led uh, businesses. But then there's, you know, another 100 plus angel groups out there um, that are sort of gender agnostic, um, if you will, that are still worth pitching to. Um, but. Any tips and tricks then, Sean, <clears throat> on uh, woman pitching? Because, I mean, in New Zealand, majority of the female woman founders do miss out on getting their funds or they have to really bring quite aggressive characteristics of themselves up sometimes. How, how, what sort of advice can you give for a, a woman founder? Um, I mean, I think, I think one of the struggles is, uh, you know, the Golden Seeds, I think, struggles with some, with some female founders um, is, I think they come in the door thinking that um, Golden Seeds is gonna be a little bit easier um, because they are a female founder, but at the end of the day, it does come down to like having a, an investable business. Um, we still kind of run them through the same, uh, you know, criteria that you would for any VC private equity, you know, what's the market size, what's the competitive landscape, who are the founders, who's the team, um, what's the ability to scale this, um, things like that. Um, so I, I don't know whether uh, some female founders might think they're coming into a friendlier environment um, than they are. Um, I, I mean, it, it is on one hand, it is a little bit friendlier, but it's still um, fairly rigorous. And I, I want to say it's only like 7% um, of the companies that pitch to Golden Seeds get funded. So it, it's not, you know, 50% uh, get funded or anything like that. It's still pretty selective criteria. And, um, you know, I think some of the same pitch tips and criteria that you would, you know, make sure that it's all in there that, uh, you know, you know, your market size and you go to market strategy, you have a good solid, you know, plan for three to five years of where you hope to take it, um, you know, st still apply. So I don't know if there's a, any sort of special sauce, if you will. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Did that, did that answer your question? Yep, Sean, it, it did. And it, it, it was very useful actually to understand golden seeds a bit more, Sean. I'm just trying to think, um, I've been trying to get my head around the opportunity in New Zealand as well. And 
um, I think Suze Reynolds from uh, the Angel Association in New Zealand, I think they did put, put a report of something like 18% of angel investment money goes to female-led startups here. So, and I'm seeing it's the usual pipeline and um, system bias issues, um, uh, pipeline how well developed it is, how many good opportunities are you seeing? As you said, you're still being robust on quality, um, but you just don't see that many female-led companies. Um, but there's also um, thinking through as a system, what sort of conscious and unconscious biases we have um, when we look at these companies um, and how we evaluate startups. So thinking what can be done in a New Zealand context as well um, to grow this, um, grow, have more successful female-led companies here. Yeah, I mean, I know Golden Seeds does a good job of sort of outreach to, to the community. So um, we're always on, you know, uh, university pitch competitions and other speaking series. Um, so in, in Boston here, we have a, a very good ecosystem. So uh, that it sort of cultivates um, people who might not necessarily have considered being an entrepreneur. Um, there's these fun sort of pitch competitions that, you know, where there's beer at the end and uh, they're at university. So I, I think it introduces the idea to a lot more people who can then um, spin up an idea. And the fact that Golden Seeds is out there with a focus on funding women, um, you know, will bring more people to the table. So, um, you know, I'm not that familiar with New Zealand, um, you know, the ecosystem in general of how you incubate these people from, you know, universities um, and whatnot, um, and, and if it's similar there. I do know from an angel standpoint, um, the way that the angel groups are funded is a bit different. So in the US, um, you know, I'm as an angel, typically pay an annual like membership fee to the angel group to get deal flow, you know, so I'll see 50 companies come through uh, golden seeds. And whereas in New Zealand, um, I believe that most of the time the money comes out of the, the capital fundraising piece. So that's a, a slight difference. Um, so it's, it's free to pitch to any angel group in the US if uh, you're thinking about going overseas. Nina, do you want to just clarify any of that for, for Sean? Um, yeah, sure. So um, for Enterprise Angels, we do have membership fee for members, um, but we do charge a transaction fee for if, you, if a company successfully raises capital. Um, we're seeing a bit of a shift in the market at the moment and trying to figure out how our business plan works better because obviously um, venture capital funds come in, they charge 2% management fee, which fully resources them and means they don't charge any fees. So if we don't step up our game, we're going to miss out on deal flow. But by the same token, we have a ton of compliance and stuff that we have to do as well so so it's just finding that right balance but um yeah yeah right. the market the market is getting um, um shaken up a little bit and that's with a lot more people coming into it across mm. border and um looking at diversity more and purpose-led businesses and impact-driven funds are, are coming through a lot more now too which is really good to see yeah. yeah, it's quite interesting on the deal pipeline, actually, and the uh, gender of, you know, like people that bring us deals. So um, we've got about 10% female investors um, in our, as part of our membership, pretty small. When you look at our portfolio, about 10% of our companies are founded by females. <laughs> so interesting correlation. Yeah. Um, but in terms of pipeline, there's not actually that much more. There's not much drop off um, when it comes through. So the the number of females that are coming to us raising capital uh, isn't that huge. And I don't know whether it's um, the forum or you know how when there's job applications and the, the way that they're worded can put females off. So, um, you know, there's probably something in that or, uh, yeah, or the fact that it is, you know, totally male dominated. It's kind of a chicken egg thing. We need more female investors, um, women founders. Actually, we're seeing more female founders in the uh, purpose-led businesses as well, so for the impact yep. game. Uh, so yeah, it's it's really interesting. But, um, need to yeah. get some. They say that 
Yeah, they say if you want diversity, you actually have to go and work for it and you'll mm. get good results. Because, um, yeah. yeah, there is something they say about the the job description, right? It's like uh, um, uh, a man will look at a job description and think he can do 90, you know, he can do 50% of it, but he'll go and apply. A woman will go, oh, I can only do 90% of that, so they won't apply. Yeah. yeah. So you're pretty far when it comes to getting investment, they want to be 100% ready first. Yeah, but I think if you do, if I think the impact fund, you might get more with the purpose lead, you might get more woman investors. So therefore you might get more woman um, founders coming through with the companies, which would be great. Yeah. Yeah, and I also find, um, you know, services and products that are centered towards women also typically struggle to get funded as well because you're pitching to a group of investors who are predominantly male um, and they, they don't get it. So, I mean, when I pitched paint night uh, to investors, you know, at the end of the day, we were a girl's night out um, was typically, and, you know, my, my target audience was 25 to 35 year old women, but uh, most investors were uh, male and over the age of 65. So they, they just didn't understand the business at all. Um, which opened up the opportunity for other investors who, you know, could get past that uh, to make money. Laura, you got a thing about it. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, like if you don't have the diversity of the investor group, then you're going to miss out on opportunities because, you know, a huge amount of the population that is under 60 and female, you know, have a huge amount of spending power. And um, you're right, a lot of investors just don't get some of these uh, yeah, newer, newer things that are coming out. Um, mm. Laura, I noticed you're welcome. Hi, did you want to ask Sean a question or put something on the table? Yeah, sure. Hi, Sean. Um, I did some stalking on you and I see that you're also involved with Techstars that's been around for a wee while in Boston. I um, know Katie Ray and the original crew behind that. So I was just wondering, even in like ecosystems that are pretty mature like Boston, do you think these like incubators and accelerators still have a place? Um, as things sort of evolve. I guess New Zealand is a bit behind times, just in, for context, they used to run something called Lighting Lab, which is our original <laughs> accelerator program in New Zealand. And the government is sort of looking at these programs right now and um, trying to figure out what the plan with those will be um, sort of for the next decade. So I'm just sort of keen to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I, I do believe in accelerators. Um, but they come at a very certain stage in the life cycle of a company. Um, and, you know, sometimes if, uh, well, there's, there's a couple of things with um, accelerators, sort of because of Y Combinator and Techstars, there's been an explosion of accelerators. So there's an accelerator for anything and everything. Um, and there's probably uh, some calling that needs to happen within um, accelerators. But um, if they're done right, um, I've seen them work really well, particularly if they fit um, in the life stage and it's typically very early on. Um, you know, oftentimes accelerators, because they're taking um, a stake in the, the company and if nobody's familiar, um, I think Techstars gives like $125,000 to the company um, and takes about 6%, um, which if you're sort of in the idea stage, that's actually a reasonable uh, exchange. But if you've got 2 million in revenue and you've de-risked de it pretty significantly, 6% of your company is very high uh, for a $125,000 investment. Um, and they're not gonna be able to probably bring um, as much value to the table um, going through their 12 week accelerator program, um, as opposed to somebody who's just starting off. So um, I do believe in them. I, I just think it has to be at the right stage. And particularly, it, it comes down to the founders too. Um, you know, a lot of founders think they're supposed to be able to do everything. Um, but the really good founders know that they're really good at a very small portion and need to build a team. And accelerators can bring that team of advisors, mentors, and connect them to other people who can really round out their team um, and help them get to the next level and uh, really coach that founder up. So, um, but yeah, I, I think it's 
pretty early on. And, um, you know, with Techstars, they, they do a really good job of actually um, giving sort of third party validation to companies. So as angel uh, investors, often you're thinking, am I crazy for being the only one who's writing a check to this business? Um, and when Techstars kind of like gives their stamp of approval, um, it, it gives you confidence that there's sort of this other group of people who are going along with it. So I, I tend to think it, uh, it helps companies a lot, um, right or wrong. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Theranos, but they got a lot of third party validation um, and that didn't turn out well. <laughs> uh, we've got at the moment, Sean, the New Zealand market, we're getting a lot of um, people coming across from other countries like Startmate in particular, and they're just providing a higher uh, that that minimum amount, the the input to the to the the company's fund, and so it's pushing all the other accelerators having to put try and find more money to give to the startups when they're coming into the their incubators as well and accelerators, um, and then also they're able to because they have more staff and resources, they're able to offer the opportunity to companies at different stages in their life cycle. So it makes it quite hard to, like some of them we might get starting on the growth journey as opposed to at that early startup stage. So New Zealand yeah. market is just going through this massive big, yeah, it's full, it's a full market. <laughs> I, I think, you know, one of the things that um, I, I often see that entrepreneurs uh, sort of make this mistake, uh, they know that investors are gonna do due diligence on them, but oftentimes uh, founders rarely do due diligence on the uh, investors. And they should hold investors to a higher standard of, besides writing a check, what do you bring into the table? Um, so when you're thinking about um, you know, signing the papers with an accelerator or an investor or an angel, um, really quiz them on what expertise that they have, what connections do they have, what networks do they have, how can they continue to help out the company um, you know, in addition to just writing a check. So. Oftentimes, uh, you know, I, I ran into this situation myself with Paint Night that uh, we had an investor who um, sort of overvalued our company. And at the time, it was sort of an ego rush of like, wow, we're finally getting the recognition. Um, but when we would ask them for help on, you know, finding a CFO or something like that, they were like, I don't know, you guys go help, you know, go find it. Um, so they weren't really helping us in areas that we needed. So uh, definitely do your due diligence on accelerators or investors before you take the money. Um, so, you know. Hey, kia ora, you kia ora, Sean. Hi, how are you, Lily? Very good, thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me well. My teeth are still on the mend. Um, but thank you very much for sharing um, your great words of wisdom. Um, when you speak of, um, it's also very important to, um, do due diligence on the investor. Um, you're quite right. And I'd just like to explain a little bit. Hopefully you can hear me because it says internet connection is unstable. But um, I, yeah, I, 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 I work with grassroots entrepreneurs, in particular um, Māori entrepreneurs, Tangata Whenua of New Zealand. So if you know of New Zealand, we're bicultural society. Māori is the uh, Tangata Whenua, the people of the land. Um, and from colonization, um, a lot of business opportunities weren't presented to us because of we didn't have access to our lands that were taken and so we couldn't get loans and what have you. Now, now things are changing. Um, it's becoming more of a fairer society, which is wonderful. There's still a lot to do, but there's a lot more Māori entrepreneurs wanting to get into business. The problem is how we operate is we generally succeed when we when we sort of support each other so for example in our region of Taira Fiti which is the east coast we are working with the businesses to help them understand what their idea is help them get their business plan help them you, you know marketing all the support that it takes the wraparound support to get the businesses off the ground the dilemma we're having is um, when it comes to any type of scaling or any startup, nobody wants to touch us. None of the VCs, none of the funders, none of the government agents. It's just harder, so to speak. It's not that they don't want to touch us, it's just harder to access capital mm -hmm. for many Māori businesses. So what we're doing is we're actually... 
Oh, Lily, the good yep. part. Lily, can you hear us? No. Oh, hopefully Lily can come back and we can, um, I wonder if, if Lily, if you turn off your video, we might be able to have um, voice. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I can start to answer yep. some of the question. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, there, there's, as I was saying before, there's sort of lifestyle businesses and investable business, and both are good, profitable businesses. And, you know, I'd be curious to learn more um, of what they're trying to stand up uh, in particular um, what types of businesses that they're trying to, to stand up. Um, Lily, are you back? Oh, I'm so Lily. sorry. I'm it's so okay. sorry. You were just getting to the juicy know. part of what you were trying to do. So you, if, yeah, you, if you want start to, from that piece. If you want to turn off your video, maybe the audio will come through clear. Okay. Um, that's one of the ones we want to do is beef up our Wi-Fi's in the rural areas. <laughs> Perfect. But, um, but, but, but no, literally, we're working as a collective to um, create our own funding mechanisms where we're literally linking non-profit with profit. So we've got one VC at the end of it that are waiting for our business to scale, but we need support at the beginning stages um, to help carry and drive and work with our businesses to get to that stage. But what we've found from previous experience is if our businesses operate alone, they don't work. But if they operate with us, um, and as I say, with our collectives, you might call us business hubs, you might call us accelerators, I don't know, I don't know what your word terminology is. But we literally work with our businesses and push them through their early stages. So I don't know if, 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 if your people um, or anyone you know has appetites to support those beginning stages. Because what, what we're finding with a lot of the investors coming to New Zealand, they're focusing on our All Blacks, our ones that are all really great and want to scale them, but they're not helping at the beginning, nurturing our junior rugby players, getting them the oranges and the and the water bottles. And that, that's where the, the strength starts is at the beginning. Because in Māori Dam, you've got to build the relationships to get the trust because we've been screwed over so many times and there's a mistrust. So it's imperative to build the long-term relationships from the beginning and then succeed together with the All Black, if that makes sense. It, it, it does. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, let's connect uh, offline. I'd love to learn more about uh, sort of the, the individual businesses. Um, as I was saying, when you kind of get cut off, um, if I could really understand the businesses and, and whether they're lifestyle or whether they're investable. And, you know, for those that really want to grow um, from potentially a lifestyle business, you know, I, I always use an example of like a pizza, you know, a pizza shop um, or a pizza restaurant. Uh, if you want to have one location, you're not going to find a lot of investors, but if your larger dream is to open up, you know, a thousand restaurants, that's going to be more interesting uh, to talk to investors and they might get behind that um, idea. So it, a lot of it comes down to like scaling and understanding the business is better and, and why, um, you know, and, and it just be, it might be a mind shift. And then there's nothing wrong too with saying, I just only want to open up um, one pizza shop that might be perfect for the entrepreneur and we'll make them happy. Um, it just might be that they, they shouldn't seek out venture capital funding. They, they, there can be bank loans and other, uh, sources of funding that they should look at, you know, crowdsourcing or something like that. Um, that might be a better avenue for what they're trying to accomplish. Just to quickly, briefly, you know, what, what is a lot of a lot of our businesses are trying to go online and create online e-commerce um, activities to reach global audiences. So, yeah, that, that's one of the main movements at the moment. Yeah. And it, are, are they more of like, um, you know, trying to create a product and then put it online or are they trying to be more like an Etsy and being e-commerce um, where anybody can sell their products online? Um because there's, there's both happening. Yeah. Mm. I think, so the, how about you help yeah. Lily off, offline? I'm just conscious of our, our time. Um, yeah, they are, they are the both sessions. But if you put your email address, Sean, 
in the chat there so that people, if they want to contact you, they can. And you and Lily can connect either via the Slack channels or email directly because they've got some great little e-commerce businesses starting down there. There you go. Good. Thank you. So do we have any last questions for Sean? Does anyone else have anything else they wanted to? No? All good? Great. Okay, well, thank you, team. Thank you for showing up. And Sean, thank you for sharing your experiences and um, yourself and your what you're planning on doing here in New Zealand. And um, we'll go back to our little bubbles now that we're in lockdown. And um, hopefully we see you in New Zealand soon, or in the new year, perhaps. And yeah. thank you for sharing. And thank you, team, for coming. Yeah, stay thank safe, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.